to the Cake Sugar Coach podcast. Join me each week as I interview experts who will share the science of sugar, sugar addiction, and different approaches to recovery. We hope to empower you with the information and inspiration, insights, and strategies you need to break up with sugar and fall in love with healthy whole foods so you can prevent and reverse chronic disease, lose weight, boost your mood, and energy. Feel free to go to my website for details on my coaching programs and to access free resources, kicksugarcoach.com. Hello and welcome everybody to an interview today with Eric Edmeets. And it is with great enthusiasm that I introduce you to him tonight as a guest on our summit. He is considered to be groundbreaking in the world of lots and lots of different areas. Actually, he's a serial entrepreneurial, but in our context today, he's done groundbreaking work in the areas of health, nutrition, and behavioral change. And he has touched the lives of hundreds of thousands of people around the world. He's renowned for his transformational WellFit program, where he walks you through a 90-day process of unhooking from junk food, getting onto whole foods, and really creating massive transformation in body and mind. He is on a mission to uh, improve the lives of individuals. Health is one aspect of it, and he knows personally and professionally Um, the power of going sugar-free and how detrimental it can be when we're consuming it, especially in excess. Let's see what else to add about him. He's got a couple of books coming out. One of them is about, it's called The Evolutionary, no, it's not called The Evolutionary Gap. What's it called again? The Evolution Gap. Oh, shoot, The Evolution Gap. And he's got another one called Post-Diabetic, which is going to come out in the spring, and his first book is going to come out in October. So uh, welcome, Eric. Thanks for having me. So let's um, let's start with your story with sugar. I recall a little bit from your history that back when you were a teenager, you were you were in the deep end with it, and it was not going well. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I I wouldn't back then have said it had anything to do with sugar. You know, I I was like everybody else around me. We you know, sure we drank Coke sometimes, and we, we ate ice cream, and you know, we were normal. And none of us none of us were what you would consider even back then to have been overweight or anything. Like it was just. And we maybe a few of us here or there, but it wasn't like I, I wasn't deeply concerned about food. Um, and then I went to a, a business seminar and and one of the things that came up there was about, you know, putting the right stuff in to get the good, you know, good output out. And so I, I, I took my first ever, this is back in 1991, I took my first ever vacation from sugar. And, and some other things, you know, it was, uh, but, but I, over the next 30 days, I, I lost 35 pounds. I, I, I cleared up the, you know, chronic and cystic acne that I'd been living with and, and all my digestive problems went away and, and what have you. And that, that really got me thinking a lot about food and about sugar and the food industry generally. Right. Right. Um, have you been basically a sugar-free man since then? No, I, you know, I, and I, I, I have to say, I mean, that English, I mean, I think many languages do this, but we, we take a word and, um, and then we put a lot of stuff in that one word, you know, like the word love, you can love your pet and you can love your wife, but I suggest that you love your pet and your wife differently. You know, it's, it's it, there, there's, it, you know, the word love is this all encompassing thing. And, and I think that we have to recognize something like that along the lines of sugar as well. And, it, you know, it, that, there are sugars that we have a long-standing and evolved relationship with, and there are sugars that are newly introduced to us, and forms of processing sugar that are newly introduced to us, which are even more detrimental. So, I, I what I would say is that I have a conscious relationship with the best kinds of sugars, and a recognition of what our evolutionary relationship with sugar was supposed to be like. That I do what I can to, um, uh, you know, adhere to. Got it. Very good point. So when I when I when I say sugar, you're right. There's sugar in all plant foods, all of them. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm I'm always referring to the refined processed carbohydrates. So yeah, in that case, foods. yeah, I'm more or less. I'm not going to say it. Uh, you know, I'm not going to like I was at a, I was at my girlfriend's ex husband's wedding. Uh, you know, which is which is super fun uh, in <laughs> Estonia. And you know, I I I didn't have the the the, the wedding cake because it was a cheesecake and it just uh, but they had these little like little you know, uh, mini cake things that didn't have the cheese in them. And of course they had sugar in them, but I'm at the wedding and I make an exception to that. But I also recognize that I'm not living with health debt. And, and this is a very important distinction that you see when I was living, when I was living with health debt, that is to say, carrying extra weight and dealing with lots of symptomology, 
then um, then that's a bit like spending money frivolously when you're in financial debt. So, you know, I'm at a place now where when I do something like that, it doesn't have this massive immediate impact. And I don't, I don't find myself waking up in a casino in Las Vegas with a tiger in my room because I ate one piece of sugar. Um, and I think that, you know, but I recognize that for, for, for uh, um, in, in my life, that if I allow something like that to go on two or three days in a row, I might, I may well wake up in that hotel room. Mm-hmm, totally, totally. Uh, why does this topic interest you? And why are you passionate about it? Like, you've got so many you know, interests. Why this one persists for you? Why is that? Yeah, it, it you know, it persists because the, the the change from unhealthy to healthy was so profound for me that I um, like, it, we're talking about a quality of life upgrade that I, I have to look at my life today and wonder if I would even consider my life to be still worth living, if I was living the way I was back then, I just to put it in perspective, I had chronic sinus infections that meant that I had not breathed from my own sinus patches in years. I had chronic throat infections that meant that my, my tonsils were frequently flowing with blood and pus, like re- re- this was regular. Um, I had digestive problems that were so debilitating that when the cramps came in, I look, I've witnessed partners of mine with menstrual, with men- menstruation cramps. And I can tell you, I'm, I'm in the league. I get it. I, I, I'm of the worst of them. I could literally end up doubled over, unable to walk. It, I was living like that. But what was crazy about it all is that I didn't regard myself as sick. It was just what I'd gotten used to. It's just what I'd gotten used to. I asked the question now at 53 years old, if I'd been living that way for the last 40 years, would I still want to live? I doubt it very much. It was unbelievably painful and difficult. So what, what happened in my case is that I my my quality of life didn't just double it's like it's 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 there's not even a mathematical scale for it the one is suffering and the other one is unbelievable amounts of content and joy and to make that transition was so unbelievable for me that i just have a compulsion to share that experience with other people mm-hmm. and was it linear for you like was there like okay so you go to this event someone starts to raise your awareness about the power of nutrition in, you know, setting your life up for this, this contentment, this joy, this success that you're experiencing. And did you just kind of like get it, the light bulb goes on and you start making changes? Or was there a lot of sort of back and forth backsliding? No, No, well, okay. In my case, there wasn't a great deal of backsliding. And and I do want to talk about backsliding and what triggers that and so on. It wasn't so much backsliding. It was that um, it's that I was unsatisfied with the level of information that was available to consumers about food at that stage. I mean, if you think about this, this is 1991. There was no paleo diet. There was no Atkins hadn't happened yet. So none of that stuff was out there. There was no answer to turn to. And so what happened in my case was I had this incredible health turnaround. But the truth is, it was inspired by Tony Robbins. It was a business seminar by Tony Robbins. And, um, and it was a very surface conversation about food, although very impactfully delivered. But then, you know, a couple of things happened. Like one thing that happened, I recognized was that um, uh, like, for example, back then, Tony Robbins was practicing veganism. And that I, I support people's decision to want to go in that direction. I, I I might question some some you know I might question some of the steps you need to take to get there, but but I as I dug into that and I explored that I decided I was not prepared to turn my life experience and health over to anybody else. It was going to be up to me to learn this stuff. I asked one of my doctors after I didn't have to have surgery, and I said to my doctor, "Listen, hey, listen." Um, how long did you go to medical school? And he said six years. And I said, and and like roughly how many semesters, how much time did you spend studying nutrition, food, that kind of stuff? None, literally none. And I, that to me was one of the most shocking things in my life. Because And, and what's interesting is even, and I asked my uncle the same question. My uncle was a very well-renowned orthopedic surgeon. So he did more like 12 years of medical school and still did not study food. And when I asked him the same question, he cocked his head to one side like a dog does when it's confused. Like, None. But in that moment, he realized what a good question it was. And we had the most fascinating conversation about how it's even possible to get through medical school without understanding food. Can you imagine taking your car to a mechanic who doesn't understand oil, gas, uh, 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 automatic transmission fluid, antifreeze, the very things that the car needs to operate? And so for me, 
it wasn't so much a question of like willpower versus backsliding. For me, it was an it was an intellectual process of investigation. So I started reading everything that I could read. I tracked down this one article by S. Boyd Eaton that he wrote in 1985, and it popped up on the internet in about 1995. And that was the first day that I wrote about food. I wrote this article called The Human Diet. And I was basically putting forward a theory. It was really his theory more than mine, but it was that every species on earth has an evolved dietary relationship with food. And if the more or the closer you are to that relationship, the healthier you're going to be. Then, I mean, I continued the research and then I started visiting hunter-gatherer tribes in East Africa to go deeper into the whole exploration. And each time I learned more, I became more adherent to the principles, but also, and this is where we do talk about the backsliding issue, I found something out fascinating, and that is that I am all about freedom. I, I, I am all about, I'm, I'm very uh, about personal freedom, freedom of speech and freedom of movement and freedom of choice, which is tough because if you exercise modern day food freedom, then you're going to eat sugar all the time because you have a genetic proclivity. We have an attraction and a genetic life-saving, once life-saving craving for sugar. And, and, and it used to be controlled for us seasonally. So we didn't, it never went out of line. But now if you practice freedom, you just follow. I'm going to listen to my body. People tell me, I'm like, don't listen to your body. Your body's like 5 million years old. It's, it, it's, it's information is like outdated. And, and that's where I started getting into the behavioral change side of it so that we could give people genuine food freedom. That is the ability to eat without regret and to not eat without feeling like they're missing out. Mm-hmm. Incredible. Right. That whole intuitive eating. Yeah. Left to my own intuition. I can tell you right now, Eric, I would eat black forest cake for breakfast lunch and dinner. I saw Kit Kat cereal breakfast the other day. I mean, Kit Kat cereal what? breakfast. If I were listening to my body, like my, you know, my, the six year old, I, I want to try that. Well, no, I bloody that would have been my breakfast of choice for sure. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, and, and I think that there's a very important, you know, speaking of the evolution gap, and this is also in the post-diabetic book, consider that, listen, for the vast majority of human history, and by that I mean 99.9999% of it, our um, cravings and our metabolism and our neurotransmitters, our bodies evolved to live in nature and largely sub-Saharan Africa. So, so let's talk about sugar availability in sub-Saharan Africa. Good luck. It's not. It's not available. Where are you going to find it? It's very rarely seasonally available. When really? does it happen? It happens when you when berries ripen on the tree. How long are they ripe for before somebody else picks them or another bird gets them or whatever the case might be? There, you have days to get at them and then another berry ripens for a few days. But all of that happens in the autumn season preparing for winter. Then what else might happen? You might in the autumn season and maybe to some degree in the late summer, you find root vegetables. While not outright sweet, they're clearly carbohydrate and say sugar based, right? And then you might stumble upon honey from time to time. But African bees, because they grew up with humans, like the, the North American bees are dumbasses. They put their hives outside where you can see them. They, they, they make them. African bees hide their hives so well because humans have been hunting for honey for all these years. So if you want to find a beehive in Africa, you're looking for a little wax chimney about this big in the forest. And that's where the beehive is inside there. So our ancestors didn't have like... They couldn't just go to the store and or dial up Amazon and get honey delivered. They had to find it, which meant that honey was a rare and important resource. So we evolved powerful cravings and instincts to go get it. Because you see, let's imagine that you and I live out there in the wilderness and I have a powerful craving for sugar, but you don't. I mean, you're way better off, right? No, you're not. Because what it means is that when the fruits are ripening, I'm going to go eat my face off. When, when I find a beehive, I'm going to stuff my face. You're going to be like, I'm not really interested. But here's the kicker. Because I'm eating all those carbs in that time of year, I am gaining a tiny bit of weight. Maybe it's two or three pounds. But that weight is a combination of stored energy and water. And that is going to mean that when the winter comes, which there is drought, it's long, dry season. When the winter comes, I'm going to make it. And sadly, you're not because you didn't eat enough sugar. Now the problem is we take that craving and we bring it into modern society where the food industries have figured out how to create garbage sugar, which still triggers all the same instincts for us and scattered everywhere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As you so, can see, I'm a little passionate about it. Oh my God. I love it, Eric. You're so, you're so wonderful. 
So people are naughty. They're like, yep, that's my experience. I crave it. I want to binge it. I'm obsessed about it. I can't get enough of it. I'm, I'm hooked. How do we, how do we unhook ourselves and, and just, you know, seasonally eat the, you know, the whole food versions of it, but all this other garbage sugar, how do we unhook from that? Okay. In order to um, fix a problem, you have to understand the problem. And if you think the problem is that we like sugar and that we eat too much of it, then you go, well, then just stop it, right? And, you know, well, the average person will go on two diets um, a year for their entire life, their entire adult life. And they will stay on each of those diets for an average. This is according to a, a large, um, a large, large study. I can't remember. It was many thousands of people, but it was uh, it, it, the average person stays on those diets for six days. So what that means is the average person is on a diet for 12 days of the year, but they think of themselves as being on a diet for most of the year because they sit and struggle with willpower on a regular basis. Um, you brought donuts to the office. I really shouldn't. Like I'm re I really shouldn't is a message to your coworkers to convince you to do it. They, they, they think they're doing you a favor, right? So, so we, we understand that willpower isn't going to be the way to do it. Not, not for most people. So, so now let's understand the actual problem. The actual problem is that sugar was once life-saving, literally. Like literally it was life-saving. If you didn't eat enough carbohydrate foods in the autumn, you wouldn't make it through the winter. That's just the truth of it. So once you recognize that, you realize that's where the craving comes from, but then you realize another powerful truth about sugar that I'm sure you've seen all through your summit. Many people have talked about it. Sugar stimulates appetite. So sugar makes you hungry. This is why food manufacturers put sugar in things where it has no business being because it'll make you eat more. The more you eat, the more you buy, the more you buy, the more profit they make. So, you know, sugar is the ultimate thing. But now let's take a look at recognizing how that even works. You and I are walking along 10,000 years ago in the African savanna and we stumble upon a fruit tree. And, and the fruits, by the way, are about the size of, say, a large grape or a small plum. And they're about 80% pit and just a layer of flesh around the outside, like all wild fruits are. Wild fruits don't have that much flesh. They have just enough to bribe you to move the seed somewhere. That's all they're doing is they're just trying to say, look, I'll be, I'll be tasty as long as you put me over there away from the parent plant. So, so we grab some of these and we eat them. And, we, and after a while, we're going to feel like our bellies are full because normally your belly is only about the size of your fist. When, when it's not full of food, it's, it contracts to the size of your fist, which means a snack can fill it right up. So let's imagine that you and I are walking along and this time I'm the one who says, oh, my stomach's full. I'm done. But you have a different genetic marker than me, let's say. Your genetic marker is that as you eat this sugar, your insulin level spikes up to manage that sugar. And then it breaks the sugar down so quickly that you're left with a surplus of insulin, which generates a sugar craving right? So you're on this roller coaster. I'm eating some and now I, I think I'm done. My stomach's full, but I'm, I, I, I'm, I have low blood sugar. I, I, I'm over, I have too much insulin. So now I need to eat more. So what do we do? We walk about 10 feet away from the bush and then you turn to me and go, you want to go get some more? Well, how many of us have done that? How many of us have done that at a party? I'm going to have one little thing. You want to get some more? I'm going to have one. You want to get some more? That is an old life-saving evolutionary throwback. The problem is, is that now it's around us all the time. And worse than that, it's snuck into many of our foods. So our food cravings, our sugar cravings are being triggered on like by the food industry to get us to buy more. So once we understand that, once we understand the mechanism, here's the next part that's more fascinating. And this is exactly what I think your summit is really about. And that is this. When you don't eat sugar, you don't crave sugar. That, that is one of the toughest things for people to recognize because most people have never not eaten it. Like they've never, they think they've not eaten it except that they were eating pasta, which is also a form of sugar. And then they think they were not eating it because they bought the sugar-free version of it. Well, no, no, it's, it's buried everywhere. So most people have never like taken a proper break from it. So they don't know that once your metabolism has understood that the sugar season is over, it stops generating the cravings. Plus on top of that, you have a candida die off. Like, cause you know, your gut bacteria communicates with your neurology. And you, if you have a lot of sugar bacteria, then it's sending this message up to the brain, go and get more sugar. We want more. It's like, I call it the digestive democracy. It's like the, the house of digestive Congress. And when you're eating a lot of sugar, you elect more sugar favorable Congress people in your belly. When you stop eating sugar, you have a gut bacteria die off, you, 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 you kill off your candida, and so your, 
your metabolism switches gears and your gut bacteria stops asking for sugar. And after only sometimes as quick as two to three days, the craving's gone. And so when you realize that, then what it means is that people can quite literally in a week change the relationship with sugar on a permanent basis. That doesn't mean they'll never eat it again, but it's knowing the mechanism of freedom. In our world, the way it used to be is that sugar became available and it was your responsibility to go and eat as much of it as you could, but then mother nature would take it away. Now mother nature doesn't take it away. So we need to use consciousness and willpower for a short window of time to gain our freedom back for the next season. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Incredible. And one of the other pieces that happens, it's fall, we're binge eating fruit, we're fattening up a little bit, we're putting some some uh, water and, and extra calories stored in, on our body. And then at this certain point as well, is that it, it, it actually sets in a form of insulin resistance, which affects yeah. the mitochondria. And then we get we get sluggish. We don't actually want to move. We're literally at the mitochondria level inspired to not burn calories. Thank you very much. Conserve those. Go for it. Hibernate. What's, what do you call it? Hibernate. Yes. Yeah. It's, well, it's... Or, or for humans, we just, uh, we just, we get, we get tired. We get lethargic. All we want to do is eat. I'm like, that's not because you're a sloth <laughs> or a glutton. It's literally evolutionary, you know. It is. It is. It survival. is a form of hibernation. When we think of hibernation, we think of bears who go sleep off the winter, right? Yeah. But think about what happens to the bear. The bear is eating berries and fat like crazy all through fall. Mm -hmm. It's fattening up. It's slowing its metabolism down so that it can burn the lowest amount of energy possible during the season of the greatest energy shortage. So we do the exact same thing. We just don't sleep, right? Mm -hmm. We still hibernate. We, we, the more sugar you eat, you slow your metabolism down, you become slothful, you become tired and you conserve energy. It's a, it's, it's a form of hibernation. You're slowing your metabolism down so that you don't burn your energy off too quickly because who knows how long this winter is going to last. Or this drought or yes, this famine. Yeah. Right, right. Amazing. Dr. Hyman in his book, uh, The Blood Sugar Solution says, you know, if you have a health condition of any kind, any kind, if you need to lose weight, you have a health condition of any kind, you got no business putting um, carbohydrate, like even some whole carbohydrates, but any refined carbohydrates in your body until you've sorted that out, then you can figure out what role it does or doesn't play. Um, do you want to comment on that? Or, that, you know, what's been your experience with Wild Fit? And is that advice that you give? You know, I, I, um, generally speaking, I think that when, when somebody is um, ill or injured, right, ill or injured in any way, um, then uh, what, what we want to do is make sure that we're only putting in what the body needs during that time and not putting any, anything in that's going to stress the body during that time. So sugar in all its various forms, even the good ones, is somewhat stressful. The reason that we Right. Like, cause we burn sugar, fat, and protein all as fuel sources. We're able to burn all three of those fuel sources, but look at the order in which we burn them. We always burn sugar first, always. Like if you eat sugar, you'll stop burning fat and you'll burn that sugar first. Why? Because it's toxic. It's, it's your body in a sense. It's like an immune response. It's like, we got to get that out. We got to get that out. Now, if your blood sugar goes too high, you die. Like literally, like not not figuratively, like it, it, if your blood sugar goes too high, you can die. So your body is immediately trying to regulate that down and, and, and burn it. So if you're sick or if you're injured and you're eating sugar, you're actually stressing your body during that time. That's, I don't think that that's ideal at all. In fact, I would suggest for, for, for in, in many cases, recovery from surgery, injury, disease, one of the very best things you can do is fast. As long as you're nourished, if you're well-nourished, if you're not well-nourished, do not take that advice. But if you're well-nourished, then fast because your body has where, where, where the average person carries, what is it? Two or 3000 calories of blood sugar, but we carry 200,000 calories of body fat. So if you think about that, how many days does that represent that you can survive without eating? So if you're healing from something, sometimes going into a fast where your body is burning its own internal energy and not expending a bunch of energy, trying to process food and sugar and stuff, 
then uh, yeah, I, I would, I would go with that. And, and I say that as an exceptionally fast healer. Like I had to have all of my wisdom teeth taken out and the dentist said, I'm not taking them all out. You gotta, you can have two out and then the next two. And I go, I don't think you've seen my speaking schedule, man. I can't, I can't take two full weeks of surgery. You're going to have to take them all out now. This is in California. So I had to sign a legal disclaimer, right? You know, so the, the lawyers are out there protecting everybody. So I signed the legal disclaimer. I go in for the surgery. And, and then he tells me, you're going to need to take a couple days off, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm running a movie studio at that point. I don't have time to take a couple days off. I go for the surgery. I stick the cotton in and I go and I work that afternoon. I go to the, and I'm at work the whole next day. And I basically was fine. I was totally fine. But what I had been doing, I had been largely fasting for the days leading up to the surgery and then fully fasting for the days following the surgery. One week later, I went into the surgery for the post-op and removing of the sutures and stuff. And the, the doctor goes, when were you here? And I said, a week ago, you said I had to come in in a week. And he goes, no, 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 but I'm looking in your mouth. You were, you're, you, you're, you're a bit late for your post-op. And I go, what do you mean? And he goes, you, you're about three weeks late or two weeks late. You were, you were here three weeks ago. And I said, why don't you look at the chart? And he goes, and he looks at the chart and he goes, you were here last week. And I go, yeah. And he goes, this has to be a mistake. And I said, why is it a mistake? And he goes, cause I've done thousands of these and I have never seen anybody heal that much in a week like that you are three weeks healed and interestingly enough that spurred a huge conversation about medicine and food and what have you and then he said i'm going to start recommending that protocol to people before they come for surgery totally yes i unfortunately so yeah i agree with mark yeah yeah i unfortunately had the, the different experience but i had a, a ruptured appendix actually awful didn't know what it was, really young, fairly healthy, ate well, like it was kind of like, what could this be? What could this be? They figured it out, emergency surgery. I immediately started fasting and I fasted for four days after. Truthfully, I wasn't hungry, Eric. It wasn't like a whole, it wasn't a hardship. I mean, there was little thoughts of food, but they kept bringing trays of food by and I was like, oh, thank you. No, I'm good. And yeah, boom, turned around really quickly. Great. No, like almost not even a scar. Yeah. I had that yeah, similar you know the one thing with appendix that you have to be a little bit careful of and i so i i also uh, how old were you when that happened Ooh, 40s see very rare it's it happens when people are young and mm. i i i'm doing some research about this and i'm just going to say it out loud knowing it's a theory and not a fact yeah but it's very uncommon for people to have um, uh, appendicitis like in their later years it's it's it usually happens when you're young and there, one of the reasons for that is that what utility the appendix does seem to have in its role, presumably in our immune system, is that um, it, it, it's mostly active when you're younger. And then as you get older, it shrivels up and shrivels up and shrivels up. And so by the time you get into your late, you know, into your 40s, it's about the size of a raisin. Oh. So therefore, it's no longer all that dangerous to you. Oh. Um, and so, you know, for me, I, I, I was in Africa. I was visiting the, the Hadzabe people. I'd been there for a week already. And I came out and had some gut pains. And, um, and they were reminiscent of the cramps I had as a child. And I wondered if maybe something we'd eaten had milk in it because I'm particularly sensitive to milk. And I was, and, and then, and then, um, a friend of mine said, you know, listen, you, you, you got to go get a, an MRI. And I'm like, we're in the middle of nowhere. Where do you find an MRI? We can get back. We can deal with it when we get home. She, no, 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 no. Luckily I had Vincent Padre, who's a, 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 a gut, um, a gut doctor specialist and another friend of mine, uh, Ash, and he, uh, and he was there. Um, and he's a surgeon and they both came over and did the, um, appendicitis tests on me and said, no, 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 you, you're, you're in danger. Like you're in danger. And, and one of the, one of the, one of them said, Eric, what business do you have walking around, talking to people, cracking jokes when your appendix is right? You, you the pain you must be in at the moment. I'm like, yeah, but I like, I, I can't, what, what I got a life to live here. So no kidding. We found an MRI machine in some field hospital. The waiting room was outdoors. And we found an MRI and we went and yeah, my appendix had ruptured, but here was the crazy bit. And maybe this is similar for you. My appendix was the size of a 26 year olds. Mine was large too. It was healthy. And the, yes. the surgeon I actually watched him take it out. I was awake for the surgery and I took, and I, and I asked him to take the curtain away so I could watch the whole thing. I watched the incision. I watched, and he took it oh out. And he, goes, he goes, holy crap. And I go, what? And he goes, your appendix, it is, it should be this big and it's this big. And, 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 and he, he attributed that anecdotally, of course, to the fact that I've paid such attention to my health since I was 20. So in a weird, ironic twist, being extremely healthy almost killed me. Oh my gosh. That's so interesting. Yeah. Mine was not a raisin. I know. Cause they, they, they showed the scan of it and they're like, it's quite large. It's quite big. So I remember them saying that yeah. I just assumed that was normal. 
But then one thing to know with appendicitis, just in case anybody has this situation, is while the advice for fasting is a very, very good idea, um, the one thing that's very important to know is that any time that somebody makes an incision in your abdomen, your entire abdomen turns off. It basically turns off and that's it, to protect you in case of a puncture, you know, in case you were injured by an animal or a spear or something. Mm -hmm. And so soon after the surgery, you need to give it a little bit of food to jumpstart it, to get it going again. So if you fast for too long after appendicitis, it can be quite dangerous. So in my case, I was out in the middle of Africa. I, I did the surgery. And then if you can imagine the morning I had the surgery, woke up at, eight, at six or seven the next morning, got in a Jeep and went back out into the bush just having had the surgery. Um, but when I got out there, I ate very small amounts of the things they gave us there, like little, very small pieces of meat, just because the, asked the surgeon, it said, you got to kickstart your uh, digestion. Oh, interesting. I didn't, but I wasn't hungry. So I'm hoping that I just followed the, the body on that one. Well, you seem to be doing fine. Yeah, I, I think, so. I think so. Although I slowed down my metabolism, I would say, I thought that was just, you know, as I move on in age. So uh, let's talk a little bit about your WildFit program. So you move people through the transformation of unhooking from processed foods, getting onto whole foods and, and the behavioral change. Uh, do you find there are sometimes people in there that have a bona fide sugar addiction? And how do you work with that if they're just struggling, even though they know, I know what you're saying, Eric, if I could get off it, I'll stop craving it, but I just can't seem to get there. You know, um, addiction is a funny word and, and, um, and it's an overused word. Uh, what I mean is, is that, Addiction basically is being used to describe anything habitual. Um, so let, let's talk about the difference, say, for example, between, say, heroin or caffeine addiction and nicotine addiction. Heroin and caffeine, when you stop having, they produce powerful withdrawal symptoms. When people stop having nicotine, nothing happens. I would argue that it's not addictive in the same way that heroin is. But we do know that sugar Sugar mirrors some of those physically addictive things. Like when you quit sugar, there, there, are, there can be physical manifestations of it. That said, I started WildFit with a very clear statement. And that was that we were not here to deal with addiction and we were not here to deal with eating disorders. It wasn't mm -hmm. what we were here to do. And the only reason I made that statement was that one of my team had worked in the diet industry previously. And she said, well, when you start this program, you're gonna have people coming to you with food addiction and, and with food disorder, eating disorders and stuff. And I go, no, we're not, we're not marketing for that. We're, we're here to help entrepreneurs improve their relationship with food so they'll have more energy and so they can enjoy their retirement. That's it, like we're not, but then what started happening was it was so effective that people kept telling their friends, like we didn't have a website. You couldn't, the only way you could buy it is if you happen to be at one of my business freedom programs, that's it. If you were at my entrepreneur program, you would find out about WildFit, that was it. But then people kept telling their friends and then their friends started writing to our help desk and saying, where do I, how do I, like, what do I do with this? And as the word spread like that, and it was truly like that, like for the first two years, we did nothing in the way of marketing and we just kept growing until one day we, we went from a hundred clients a year with just a little coaching business to like three and a half thousand clients in a year, like jump just like that. And it was just like everybody telling their friends. And so as that happened, now people with sugar addictions and, and eating disorders started coming to us. And, but we didn't know, we didn't know because at that stage, we didn't know to like, we, we, you know, our questionnaires weren't as comprehensive as they are now and so on. So we just didn't know, but also we found out from people afterward that they didn't disclose their, 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 their eating disorders because they thought we'd exclude them from the program. So they would sneak in with anorexia, bulimia, and, and various forms of food addiction. And we wouldn't know. And repeatedly and regularly, they would write to us afterward and go, um, I'm not anorexic anymore. I, I don't, I don't, I don't purge anymore. I'm, I'm not, I'm no longer bulimic. And the addiction I thought was an addiction is gone. So, so now we started digging into that, you know, considering we're making no concerted effort on it. We're not, we're not giving coaching on it. We're not giving therapy on it. We're not even talking about it. Why is it working? And something we found out about this, which is really, really important. And that is both in terms of addiction and in terms of psychological issues like eating disorders malnutrition and overstimulation amplify the difficulty. So let's first talk about addiction. If somebody has an addiction, not even sugar, let's say they have an addiction to um, coffee. Say they have a caffeine addiction. If they quit ca coffee, then they will probably get headaches. They might get the shakes. And they could even in some cases get like withdrawal symptoms like the flu and vomiting and stuff when, if they've been drinking it a lot. 
Now, what's fascinating with our clients was, is that at some point during the program, they would like say, take a break from coffee and have either no headache at all, or only one of those headaches where you go, I think I have a headache, you know, like that, like the withdrawal symptoms were gone. And so that got me digging into some research and figuring out what might be going on there. And, and what I've, what I've deduced from that. And the theory I have about that is that the more malnourished you are, the greater withdrawal symptoms your body kicks into. So if you're very well hydrated and very well nourished, then the withdrawal symptoms are not so severe. Now let's go over to, to, to the eating disorders. If somebody is say anorexia or uh, anorexic or say bulimic or, or both, which is unfortunately common, then, then they are by nature malnourished. They are by nature starving to death, right? They are starving and, and that's a scary thing. And, and then on top of that, they are also commonly by nature overstimulated because what they do is they eat, they, they, their starving body goes, eat something. And then they binge knowing they're going to purge it out anyway. So eat what you want. And so what do they eat? Krispy Kreme or they, you know, they eat a bunch of sugar, but they don't purge quickly enough that the sugar doesn't slam their system. So they end up with this sugar hit and no nutrition. So they're overstimulated and they're malnourished. Now, what's fascinating about that is that if you take somebody who's overstimulated and malnourished, well, let's look at another group of people that are like that, methamphetamine addicts. They're overstimulated and malnourished, and all they crave is the fastest calories they can get, which is sugar and grease. That's all. If you, methamphetamine, the meth addicts, all they want to do is eat deep fried shit and sugar. That's it. Well, the same thing is now happening to these people that say have a, a, um, a an eating disorder is they're malnourished and overstimulated. Their body is going into emergency mode and it's saying, get the fastest calories you can, which is guess what? Deep fried garbage and, sh and, and sugar. And so the cycle perpetuates. Oddly, if you take that person and you hydrate the hell out of them and you increase their intake of good stuff without even asking them to stop the other stuff, don't, don't like, 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 keep eating that, go for it, but just eat this first. What happens is, is as their nutrition and hydration comes up, their cravings for the other stuff goes down and it becomes manageable. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Incredible. Thank you. So let's uh, talk a little bit about your book that's coming out in April. It's called Post-Diabetic. Why did you write this book and, and why did why the term post-diabetic? Um, so I, I, I wrote the book. Um, I think there, there are three interlacing reasons. Uh, the first one was, is that, again, in the same way that we didn't create WildFit to deal with food addiction and that kind of stuff, we created it to just improve people's relationship with food. We also didn't create it to reverse diabetes, only we kept doing it. Like clients kept writing to us and kept writing to us and kept writing to us and saying, look, you know, there's, I'm not diabetic anymore, or I'm, I was diabetic. Now I'm pre-diabetic. And they kept saying this to us all the time. And, and funny enough, I was, I, 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 I mentioned to you in pre-show, I, I was having this um, conversation with Mark Hyman. In fact, let me, let me read this to you. This is directly out of the forward that he wrote for the book. This is, uh, this is from the forward. He says, recently, Eric, uh, interviewed me for his wild fit members. And after the interview, we discussed cause cases of reversal of type two diabetes. Eric pointed out that patients who normalize their blood sugar and stop all medications are still referred to as pre-diabetic. Instead, he suggested we should refer to them as post-diabetic. It was a light bulb moment. Now he, we go on in that book and, and he, he talks about this in the forward that he wrote that we in our book are suggesting that Type 2 diabetes should be classified as a repetitive stress injury rather than a disease. It's a repetitive stress disorder. It's the body doing what it's supposed to be doing based on what you're doing to it. It's not a, a disease. It's not attacking you. It's, the, it's like spraining your ankle. If you keep walking like that, you're going to sprain your ankle. If you keep eating like that, you're going to sprain your, 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 your pancreas or your fat cells or your insulin resistance capacity. And then what tied it all together was um, I got a phone call and the phone call was from uh, Ruben Ruiz, MD. Uh, Ruben is a, an amazing guy. He, he's my co-author on the book and he, uh, he, was, he, was, he is running three medical clinics in Southern California, largely service, uh, servicing the um, underprivileged in the Latino community. And he was 40 pounds overweight and on 10 prescription medications, hypertensive and type 2 diabetic. And so one day he's driving to the clinic, like, and by the way, many doctors are in that condition, which itself, I mean, if your doctor's in that condition, get another, get another doctor. I'm sorry, you know, sorry, but, but he was in that condition and he stopped off at Starbucks to get himself a big coffee 
so that he could stay awake on the drive to his clinic. Only despite the coffee, he fell asleep and he was in a wreck. Luckily, nobody was too badly hurt. A couple days later, two days later, I think he's in a rental car because, you know, his car's not in good shape. And he stops off at the same Starbucks and he buys another coffee and he drifts off asleep again into the HOV lane and is in another accident. Luckily, again, nobody seriously hurt. But that night he found himself having a crisis of conscience. He, he, he was like, how am I a doctor? I have no business being a doctor. I'm, I'm a hypocrite. I can't, I, you know, heal thyself. And he was really like angry and he went onto the internet and he started Googling around for stuff. I don't know what he was searching for, but weirdly he ended up in one of my master classes. And so he then did our, our 90 day wild fit journey, which is um, like say 50% um, food, nutrition, education, and 50% behavioral change processes. And at the end of that 90 days, he had lost 40 pounds and he was off all 10 of his medications he was no longer hypertensive and no longer type 2 diabetic. He called me and said, Eric, we have to get this message out to the world. Can we co-write a book together? And mm. that's, that's, that's the moment that the book became a thing. Oh, that's such an amazing story. Yes. And I remember my very first experience of someone reversing diabetes was 21 years ago. I'd gone into a 12-step program for food addiction recovery. And this guy, Eric had come in, he was obese, um, depressed, miserable. He, he was, he had like this dark storm clown around his head. You could just tell that he didn't really want to be there. He shuffled into the meeting late. And six months later, just shy of that, he was at the front of the room saying, I, you know, I'm a whole food man. I have three meals, no snacks, whole foods only. I've broken up a sugar. I was on 11 medications. I'm on one today, 10 of them have been eliminated. I've lost 75 pounds. He was absolutely massively transformed. And he said, but here's the kicker. I've been diabetic since my thirties. I'm, you know, he's in his sixties. I was told I would never get off insulin. And That's right. he has said, I'm no longer diabetic to this day. And I remember thinking, what? And I shoved the guy this time. I'm like, I don't think you can reverse diabetes. And he's, and, and this guy, Ron looks at me and he goes all the time. All the time. All the time. You get people off processed junk foods, you get them on three meals and no snacks, whole foods, you know, get them there and miracles happen with your health. And I remember thinking, but if this is true. Why is this not on the cover of the New York Times? Like, is this not just the most incredible thing? And I kept talking about it with people and people were like, okay, Florence, yeah, that's super exciting. Not, <laughs> but it really is. You know, unfortunately, it's not very exciting because not only is it not profitable, but it's anti-profitable. And, and, you know, that, that, that's a real difficulty. And I know that sounds a little conspiracy theorist and, and, you know, maybe I should go put on my little tinfoil hat, but here, here is the difficulty. Consider why it is that somebody who is pre-diabetic doesn't think it's very serious because they don't. They don't know. Their doctor and the doctor goes, oh, you're pre-diabetic. What does that mean? Uh, you should probably try to eat better. And, you know, but if it gets really bad, we've got these pills and then you can keep eating the way you want. And then you can take these pills or these injections. But imagine if you went into the doctor's office and the doctor said you're pre-cancer, you would take that seriously, right? Mm -hmm. You would take it seriously. In the case of diabetes, um, I, 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 okay. Now, do you know the do you know the tale of the two Bantings? Do you know do you know who? The, okay. Oh so yeah, I do. I know one of the Bantings, the guy who wrote the book in the early 1900s. That's right. Now yes. he was morbidly obese. Yes. And um, and his doctor recommended to him to take a break from all carbohydrates for a while yes. to reverse his obesity. And he did that. And then he wrote a book about that, which might have been the first ever Atkins diet in a sense, right? Like totally. the very first, you know. And he and he was so committed to the cause that he set it up that either people got the book for free or all the royalties went back into it. Like he it was not for profit. He wanted the message out to the world. Mm -hmm. um, now, here's the crazy thing. So first, that banting basically created a preventative measure, a measure to prevent diabetes and arguably to reverse it. Right. Now, he dies uh, and lived a lot longer than he would have because he was morbidly obese, but he, he dies. And then I don't know if it was maybe about 20 years later, another banting was born. They, so they're related. They don't know each other uh, because they, they missed, but they're related. And the second banting is in Canada. And he uh, uh, kind of rose to fame because he was the guy who discovered exogenous insulin. And he, he figured out exogenous insulin initially from dog. They, they figured out how to get insulin from a dog pancreas. And then they figured out other ways to synthesize it. But as I understand the story, he got the original patent on insulin and he sold it to the University of Toronto for $1 because he believed that people had the inherent right 
to have insulin if they needed it, because back then there was really only type one diabetes. And like, if you don't have it, you're going to die. He, he did that. And, and therefore diabetes basically should have been free for anybody who needed it. Somewhere between that sale for a dollar and today, it's become a multi hundred billion dollar industry and, um, and, and that benefits by giving advice like, well, you know, if you're feeling a little tired, you should just have a Mars bar. Oh my gosh, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, how it got into the hands of pharmaceuticals to go and profit. Yes. And to confuse the public about what is the best diet for diabetes, because they had a very strong hand in discouraging us away from the real solution. Eric, we're almost out of time. Is there any final words you'd like to share today? I know you and I could talk all day on this. Um, is there any final words you'd like to share today? Yeah. Like of sugar, sugar, addiction, sugar addiction recovery, any of those? Yeah, there's something super important. And, and I, I really want to say this. If, if, if anyone listening, if you right now you're hearing my voice and, and you're dealing with, say, a little extra weight or a lot, or say type 2 diabetes, or say a number of different autoimmune diseases, inflammation, that kind of stuff. If you're dealing with anything that they refer to as a lifestyle disease, I want you to really listen to me. And, and I want you to hear something very important. It is not your fault. And the reason they call it a lifestyle disease is to blame you. And that's something the tobacco industry figured out long time ago, because when they realized they were causing lung cancer in people, they didn't want to lose the lawsuit. So they started seeding the idea in the population that lung cancer was a lifestyle disease. Therefore, well, it's not our fault. And they now own most of the food industry, by the way. So the idea that you have a lifestyle disease is wrong. You don't have a lifestyle disease. You have a disastrous food industry ridiculous food regulation disease is what you've got a bad food education disease. It's not a lifestyle disease. Now, yes, you improve it by improving your lifestyle. There's no question about that. So I really want to be clear that it's not your fault. If you're a little overweight or you're a lot overweight or you're type two diabetic, or you have any of these lifestyle conditions, it's absolutely not your fault. They say to you, if you moved a little more and ate a little less, it wouldn't be this way. That's a lie. They say that if you just restricted your calories for a little while, everything, that's a lie. It's not your fault, but what it is, is your responsibility to turn around. And the only way you're going to do that is not by going on a diet. It's by literally changing your relationship with food. And I hope, I hope that you find a way to do that. And, and if I can ever support you in doing that, I'm always here. And coming to summits like this is an excellent step in your journey to reimagine your relationship with food. Mm, thank you so much for your time and wisdom today, Eric. Much appreciated. Cheers. Thanks for tuning in this week. If you would like more interviews, more information, and more inspiration on how to break up with sugar, go to my YouTube channel, Kick Sugar Coach, or my website, kicksugarcoach.com. See you next week.